I would like to introduce the next item on our agenda. This is a very special session and a session close to my heart as a woman and a woman involved in women economic empowerment. The session we are going to enter into is titled Bridging the Gap for Women in Science and Technology. Before we invite our speakers, I would like to call upon two women, special women. The first one is the moderator for this session, Professor Eliane Ubalijolo. Please come and take a seat. Before the session starts, I would like to welcome Juliette Kego, who is a woman poet. And she's going to enlighten this session with a poem called, Today I Will Not Bow Down. And Juliette, the stage is yours. Hello, everyone. I am with the WOW Foundation, working to advance African women in STEM education. And what we found over the last 10 years is that even though we have the resources to teach girls about STEM, climate change, you know, the SDGs, and so many other topics, there's a wall that exists. And I'm an engineer, and I'm also a poet. So what we've gone back to is the traditional African storytelling um, system. And so when we go to meet these girls, before the session, we take off our shoes, we go outside, and then we allow these girls to share their stories, their dreams, their pains, their triumphs, everything that they're about. And from that, we co-create poems. And the poem that I'm going to share with you contains many stories. Today, I will not bow. Yesterday, the clouds gathered, Baba. Yet the rains mocked us with their absence. We missed weeks of school, trekked the desert in search of water, and then the clouds lifted, Nani. But the angry rains drowned our homelands with their presence. Herdsmen and farmers clash over scarce arable lands, and both settle their fights by plowing the fields with shafts forcefully digging and tearing into the earth and valleys of women and girls in the village. Today is a new dawn. Today I shall be born and my mother will not weep when she beholds the folds between my thighs. And my father will not stare at her with accusing eyes. Yes, today, Papa will not hunch over and hiss out loud. It's a girl to the soft hum of my mother's serene silent cries, to his half-brother's spitting glances and mocking sighs. Today he shall proclaim to his kinsmen, hitting his hard warrior chest with pride, that a first-born child is gifted to him, a child who inherit his history, cattle and farmland, a girl child who will be free to love and learn the secrets of kings and his traditions of red earth. Today, I am cherished and respected. I refuse to be battered, stoned with cold rocks, and killed in honor by the calloused hands of beloved brothers and uncles on whose knees I once bounced with joy, in whose warm arms I was once lovingly rocked. Today, I refuse to be sentenced to a life prison, that cold room of resentment, bitterness, gloom, and doom. Today, I will not bow to the voices telling me to hush and stay still and watch passively as my dreams disintegrate before me. I shall not leave a sham version of life, fractured and broken. Today, I will honor and nurture the seeds, awaken, dare to dream the dreams that I long forgot to dream. Today, I will not bow to the sounds of the bullet piercing my body because my spirit is strong and unshaken. Today, I will not bow, not even when I'm attacked and maligned by lost souls shackled by their own fears. 
They seek to turn my eyes away from the pages of life, afraid that I may discover new worlds and adventures of Wangari, Mariamaba, Queen Ya Asantewa, Queen Amina, Ikon Naya, Buchi Emecheta, Marikuri, Fumilayo Ransom Kuti, as I dare to find lost pieces of myself in Makeba's Song of Africa. Ah, in the citadels of learning within the sacred halls and walls of life. Today I will not bow to the dirty old village chiefs, my bridegroom, stealers of my childhood, they who take me a mere 11-year-old for bride, a mere child birthing another child. Today I will not bow, not in guilt and definitely not in shame, to these soldiers of faith and tradition, they who strapped me with bombs and greedily plucked and sucked away the fruits and juices from my plush innocent gardens, leaving me there for dead by the dusty roadside of Mambisa forest. Today, I will not bow to the sounds of the village medicine woman as she leads her crazed dance. And at its feverish peak, they restrain me down and crudely hack off the tingling bud of my maidenhead. They cannot stomach the sensual powers of this woman child, how they fear the fires of desires burning in my shapely hips and the heavenly bliss waiting in my uncircled, beautiful body-bouncing breasts. They seek to silence my tongue so that I should not question the ineptitude of men who ride with no skills. They seek to strip me of the source of my shattering deaths of life, sentenced to an endless, aching waiting that never comes. There are many days ahead for buying, many days gone past for crying, but not today. Today I will not bow. Today I rise for every woman child, ancestors gone before me and the unborn to come. I stand here on this sacred Kigali land and proclaim that we are all worthy and whole, man, woman, and child. Today I stand tall on this stage of life. I am woman, wise, opinionated, majestic, authentically speaking my truth, embracing the fullness of everything I co-create. And when I'm done, I'll gracefully take my bow. I am Amina of Nigeria. I am Malala of Pakistan. I am Rowan of Yemen. I am Damini of India. I am Fakhunda of Afghanistan. I am Leah Sharubi. And every little girl kidnapped in Chibok and Dapchi, Yobe State, Northeast Nigeria. Yesterday, I was nameless, homeless, voiceless, dreamless. Today, I am the spirit of Africa. I am her heart and soul, and I am healed by an amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a girl like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Asante. In order to catch up with time, we're going to have a much shorter panel, but we're going to make this so powerful you will not forget any of us here. And what we're going to do
Okay, Zainab, camera. Zainab, camera, please. Is Zainab here? Okay, so Zainab, uh, if, if Zainab shows up, please she can join us at any time. So what we're going to do, one of the things in terms of uh, this space about Africa in the 21st century is we really want to scale up positive solutions. We can talk about the problems forever and ever. So our session really is about bridging the gap. And we all have phenomenal journeys. We've had hardships. We're not here to talk about it. We're here to share what are the amazing lessons we're aware of and discuss ways we see that these can be scaled up. So Seema, can you uh, launch us, please? Absolutely. So first of all, thank you. I think this is a very important session. And I, my compliments to the poet. Well, what an amazing, amazing uh, experience uh, to go through that. Um, you know, it's interesting. I was born in India, and I grew up in India when, at a time when India was very poor. Uh, we didn't even have TVs in our home. There was, no, there was no phones, not even landlines. And science and technology was seen as a way to really progress in society. And I was, uh, I was taught to actually uh, appreciate science and technology and put myself into a career in science and technology. So. Uh, throughout my life, first my father, then my husband, then my, many of the bosses that I've had have all been male, and that's probably because there weren't that many women uh, in there. So uh, I know we have talked about multiple different things in the arena of bridging the gap. So two, two things I will mention uh, that are amazing uh, learnings for me personally. On the one hand, I think we have to bridge the gap. We still are a long way off, so, but we, do, we are building bridges, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, and so there are table stakes, like um, having a, a flexible work environment, having childcare on site, mentoring, uh, networking, championship, sponsorship. Though that's all the price of entry. And that can increase representation, but until we have equal opportunities for education, equal opportunities for career advancement, equal opportunities for leadership positions, and equal pay, we will never bridge the gap. So those are important things. The second thing I will say is that it's important to have male ambassadors in our journey. And so we have a new term for it called manbassadors. And so male ambassadors who will be champions, who will remove the roadblocks for you, who have the courage to speak up about the right thing and do the right thing uh, by women. And so those two concepts are great learnings for me personally. That's excellent. Heide? Thank you so much. And my appreciation as well to the wonderful poet um, for that inspiration. And I love the no shoes um, feeling. <laughs> so <laughs> just, I mean, to start with your personal question, perhaps to say that it's not something I've really thought about, the personal pathway, but um, it's fair to say that my career started at a moment in time where there weren't actually many formal policies or enabling environments around, you know, with specific priority for gender issues. And so it's interesting to reflect whether that's a good or a bad thing. I think in many ways, um, you know, on, on the hard side, it, it meant that I always had to work harder. But I know that women still have to do that, despite the, the policies that exist. But it also allowed me to be subversive, to subverse systems. And I guess ultimately the support of you know, family and, and close colleagues, mentors, um, was really important. I do recognize, though, that I've also tended to um, be driven by the fact that I'm passionate about a cause, passionate about the work I do. And I think that gives one a resilience um, to overcome obstacles. So I wanted to talk a little bit, reflect a little bit on, you know, we talk a lot about what are good practices and what are exciting examples. Um, and by practices, I, I think we're talking about principles that are embedded in organization statutes like they are in mine around the universality of science. We're talking about policies, we're talking about programs, everything from fellowships to mentorship programs, training, prizes, etc. And actually, if you review the landscape, there's a plethora of fantastic practices. And 
what is interesting is that they cover all levels, from the, ins from the political, from governments, at the institutional, universities and other research institutions, and the individual, personal pathways. They also cover all scales, local, national, regional, global. And so just, you know, if, you, if there's a report coming out very soon by a group called Gender Insight, and they review the policies and practices at the international level of UNESCO, of the ECOSOC Commission on Science and Technology for Development, et cetera, et cetera. All the international scientific organizations, the one I run, ICSU, the International Social Science Council, the Inter-Academy Panel, which is a global network of academies around the world, the Global Young Academy, we all have policies or principles or practices of one sort or another. And I must say, in the last two days, in discussions on, the, on this topic, there are fantastic examples amongst all of you from your own institutions of really inspiring practices um, that we can learn from. But if we take stock of this, I mean, what, what we must say is that the efforts out there, if we take stock as a global science community, the efforts out there are truly systematic and comprehensive. They cover all the components of this issue of gender um, and science. Um, and they cross the spectrum from the structural to the personal, from the numbers to the voices. Um, and at the same time, the case is clear. I mean, really, who wouldn't agree with President Kagame's question or issue this morning? What did he say? I wrote it down. We cannot afford to leave our women and girls behind. Who doesn't agree, right? And yet, with all those arguments, with the case and the tools, the practices in hand, we all have examples of the barriers that we come up with on a regular basis, as women and as men. Um, and so, you know, there, there, are, there, there are persistent issues. I could give you examples now, but I don't want to take, take the time. So the question then for me is, so what's missing? What, what is the systemic game changer that we're all looking for? What will transform um, this issue in, this, in the culture of science? How will we transform the cultural DNA of science? And I dare say identifying more practices is not necessarily the answer. Perhaps we need to look for new insights. Perhaps we need new understanding of how, if you take, for example, the Sustainable Development Goals framework, the goal on, on equality of women, how that interacts in critical ways and has positive spin-offs for the accomplishment and progress we make on meeting other goals. We need to understand those kinds of interactions, and, and ICSU is doing work on this. I know UN Women is looking at that as well. We might need to look at new opportunities um, in terms of how we define work cultures and lifestyles given you know, digital revolution, artificial intelligence, etc. So new insights could be helpful, but we need new strategies. And for me, and I'll finish with this, when I think about strategies, I sort of have a two-pronged approach. On the one hand, I just think the only thing we can do is pick your patch and make a difference in your patch. My patch is Global Science, International Science Council, leading on setting global science agendas. That's the patch where I need to make a difference. So pick your patch. And then, of course, think big. Think about how your patch links to other patches. And so, you know, why... I think we need to ask ourselves in the kind of positive spirit that we felt this morning at the opening of this forum, um, this notion, it, I almost felt like I was in a zone of hope. And so we need to think, what if and why not? What if President Kagame convened the leadership of all the international scientific organizations, brought them together with ministers of science from around the world, and we committed to collecting the knowledge, collecting information and resources about the good practices out there, identifying global champions, and delivering pledges. Why not set up a global platform where we can share these experiences 
and then take it to the UN and ask for a, it's time for a new UN decade on women in science. The last UN decade on women was in 1976. Yep. It wasn't mm -hmm. about women in science. So why not? Time's up. Time's up. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tolu, please. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Vivian. So I'll reflect a little bit of my personal journey and I'll identify two discrete gaps as I see them, two potential ways that we can address. So I was, uh, you talked about being born in India, so I was born in, in Lagos um, and going through the second of four siblings, the first girl. And I think if I was going to summarize my experience in one line, I would say that core to where I am is that as, at no point, despite being the first girl, which comes with a lot of responsibilities in, the, uh, in many contexts, I was at no point under any doubt as to, firstly, my potential, my, what I was able to achieve, and at some point, clearly no one was supervising my television watching because I watched a documentary on open heart surgery when I was about seven, decided I wanted to be a doctor. Uh, you, can, you can decide if this was suitable viewing for a, for a little kid. And at, some, at no point was I, uh, was there any doubt instilled in me. So I think from a family perspective, that played a, a significant role. Outside of my family, I would say if I had to identify one thing, one other component, it would be both teachers, I'd split them into two, both teachers and the, and the sponsors. So teachers, I remember very clearly uh, the support, the similar support I received in, in, at home, which I didn't even feel as support, it just wasn't hindrance. At primary school in, in Nigeria, transferred into my experience in school in the UK, where one of my most vivid memories of a science class, a biology class, was this enthusiastic science teacher who was teaching us about, see, I remember it so clearly, it's got nothing to do with my practice now, teaching us about the mating dance of bees. <laughs> and I remember it so clearly, because he was huge, he was about six foot tall, uh, huge man, stood up on the desk and actually wiggled around and showed us the figure of eight dance that, that bees, do. and it, it, it just, seemed the most phenomenal thing to me. And I thought, wow, isn't nature and just science just so cool? And a lot of that enthusiasm was from him. And I didn't realize it at the time, but that really drove a lot of my interest. So teachers, and then in terms of a mentor, so I completed uh, medical school, and I practiced, was practicing as a, as a physician. Uh, but actually, towards the end of my medical training, where you do an elective in your final year, I wanted to do some research, because I'd done some public health training, and I thought this is a way to really understand the causes of, of ill health. And I wanted to go somewhere completely different, and I decided I would go to French Guyana. And I found somebody, I found a disease of importance in French Guyana, which is HTLV. I googled HTLV French Guyana, came up with a PhD student in Institut Pasteur, sent him an email and he responded and he was the reason I got there and I had my first real experience of, of, of research. That research translated into a, an award by the Royal Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene which I got for the paper I wrote on that and that resulted in uh, the head of the Royal Society at the time speaking to me and saying, well, what more research do you want to do? I said, well, you know, I'm going to work a little bit clinically but when I come back, I'd like to do some HIV research. He goes, okay. We've got people, got some research going in South Africa. We've got some research going on in Tanzania. Where would you like to go? And I said, Cape Town, please. But he was more than a mentor. He really advocated and put me in a, someone with very little research experience into the position where he called up and said, this person wants to do research, and I, I turned up having not visited before. So the point being, and that really is, that was 11 years ago, and I've been in Cape Town um, for that long. And without those key people, who, by the way, were all men, I wouldn't be where I am now. So the importance of that inspiration and that support uh, and that push is, uh, was, was, was phenomenal for me and I think uh, tells a lot 
about where I am now. So two key gaps I think identify, I, I, I see. But firstly is the gap between perceptions and realities. And I say that because we have a long way to go still in achieving gender equity, but we have come a long way in, in STEM, in the STEM uh, field. So for example, there is a, there is a survey called the Draw Scientist. So ever this been going on for several years where they get children of different ages to draw, to draw scientists. Yes. And then they've charted what proportion of the scientists are women over the years. So if you compare the changing, so the first thing is to say that the proportion of, of children, this is age six, around age six, drawing women has increased about 30% over the last 30 years. But that is significantly less than actually the increase we've seen in most STEM fields, with some notable ex exceptions. And so the, rea the perception in, s in young children is not keeping up with the realities, and we have to ask ourselves why. Mm. Because if we are pushing and trying to change and continuously improve the realities, why, is, why are the perceptions of children, what are they picking up that is not, is not actually keeping up with, with, with our progress? And the second gap I wanted to, um, to identify was the, the gap amongst science leaders and those we acknowledge. So, and again, this is just to bring back the, uh, the pipeline to identify the differences between attracting and recruiting uh, women scientists and retaining and celebrating. So I was at a, an international conference that would be unnamed a few months ago, and there, was, there were awards given for rising stars and awards given for, I can't remember what the term was, but let's call them risen, or not, not setting stars, but rising stars, uh, risen stars. Um, and, and one of the things that I noticed is when you look at the rising stars, the gender equity was phenomenal, mm -hmm. right? It was, I thought, wow, this is fantastic. And I turned the page to the risen. And it was phenomenal for all the wrong reasons. And this is something that we have to think very explicitly about. Mm -hmm. What are the systems, what are the structures that we go through to identify, to to push through um, these people and, and actually to ease the tension within the pipeline mm -hmm. in order to reduce the need for, for resilience uh, within, mm -hmm. within, the, uh, within the science field. So lastly, I'll end with two things that I think we can do to address. Uh, the first thing was something I mentioned already, which is that teachers are important. We talk about scientists, we talk about science, we talk about the science environment, but sometimes we forget that the science ecosystem must include schools, because it begins at schools. And teachers are important for two reasons. I think the first, for obviously for many children, is their first experience and first exposure of science. And so the content and the way that they teach science uh, is vital, as I uh, demonstrated with my, my personal experience, to really ignite a passion for science. And the impact of an enthusiastic and informed teacher can be phenomenal and to make, make all the difference. But secondly, teachers are also a bridge between science and society. Because without due attention, we forget in the same way we sometimes forget that scientists exist, don't exist in isolation. Teachers also exist within the context, within the societal context. And so without due attention, the gender biases that exist in society continue to be perpetuated by the teacher in the classroom. But conversely, having uh, well-informed teachers who, irrespective of the societal biases, are able to push through and motivate all children equally through the sciences can be phenomenal in spite of whatever degree of support there is in the family structure and the societal structure. So I think teachers are important. And the second final thing I think we need to address is to say that data matters. And Haida alluded to it uh, briefly. We need to understand what we're, first we need to understand what we're trying to change. 
And secondly, we need to evaluate whether we are actually changing it. And that speaks to the notion of matching our perceptions with our realities. Otherwise, if we're not measuring, we're not, we don't know. So you reference the Global Young Academy, so I co-chair the Global Young Academy, and one of the projects that we're doing at the moment is called a GLOSA survey, so the Global State of Young Scientists in different regions, and there's an ongoing survey at the moment looking at scientists in and off Africa totally. with at least a master's program. And I think it's important, I just want to highlight it because if we don't have the data to say, well, what are the key issues? And just to highlight a couple of things, because um, the, there is a session at 7.30 on Wednesday where a lot of the preliminary results will be, will be presented. So if you're interested in being part of that solution, I really encourage you to be at that, uh, that breakfast session. But for example, the key, so it doesn't focus on gender specifically. We really need to wrap up. Okay, but we need to look at things around the change, difference in the satisfaction. So we found already in the preliminary yeah. survey Differences in opportunities for advancement, differences in income, difference in satisfaction with work hours and with work family balance, differences in physical and mental health by gender. Mm -hmm. uh, so these are some of the issues and we'll discuss it more on Wednesday morning, so I'll, I'll stop now. Mm -hmm. So we, we actually have 17 seconds to finish this panel because of, <laughs> we're late in time. But given that we have our ambassador, <laughs> ambassador, <laughs> ambassador, uh, so everybody here knows that uh, our Excellency President Kagame is, is a champion of, of women in the world. Can you just give us a glimpse of why you are a champion of bridging the gap? Thank you so much. Uh, let me say, uh, first of all, thank you for uh, being able to put up this session. But most important, uh, I want to reiterate the government of commitment towards building the skills that are required to drive forward national uh, economy, as well as ensuring that uh, we become a knowledge-based economy, uh, but also contribute towards the development of the region. That we cannot achieve without uh, addressing barriers related to uh, disparities that occur between education for girls and boys, and that's very critical. There are several ways that we do that. And there are several ways that our institutions in the country collaboratively work together to ensure that. Definitely there are still gaps. There are still gaps in terms of completion rates between girls and boys. But there are also gaps in terms of uh, attaining uh, certain levels of education and learning outcomes between girls and boys. But recently we have seen some change. Uh, this year's national examination at the prime at second six level, we saw that the, there is almost equal proportion of girls and boys in the first tier, 10 or 20 between girls and boys in physics, chemistry, and biology. Mm -hmm. That was very exciting. Why is it happening? Why is it changing? It is changing because there are a lot of efforts that have been put in place, uh, particularly working together with the all institutions because the government of Rwanda, Ministry of Education, implements educational programs mainly through decentralized level of government, districts. So working together to ensure that we support teacher training programs, mm -hmm. dec decreasing disparities between boys and girls, ensuring gender responsive education and mentorship of girls is very crucial. Of course, we do it with the Minister of Gender and Family Planning and other stakeholders, including many of the partners here. And so this is already helping us to attain what we think we are going to, to, to attain in terms of uh, reducing these gaps with time. Mm -hmm. And there are several programs and uh, projects in place. And uh, we are delighted to be part of the move to ensuring that uh, we help to bridge the gap because that's the only way we can drive our economy we can contribute towards the uh, regional uh, skills development so that uh, the girls, as much as boys, did they come up there in terms of uh, knowledge in science, you know, technology, engineering, mm -hmm. mathematics. And we have several mentorship programs to support girls as well as boys so that we drive this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you. So our time is up. So we, we won't have time for questions. Will you allow us one question or? 
No. Okay, so one of the things I just want to do is in terms of wrapping up, this panel has talked about the whole chain, the need for stimulating curiosity in young children, especially girls. Uh, um, Honorable Minister, our ambassador has been, has shared with us really great data in terms of um, how uh, the education system is really advancing and promoting girls in science and technology. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, our colleagues have also shared that they are, in terms of, as we move forward and, and women become more experienced in their careers, we have to ensure that they have equal access to opportunities as the men in their same age groups. So let's make sure that we don't lose them through the leaky pipeline and keep them in the system. And I encourage everybody to ask gender-based questions in all the panels that are gonna come back in the next uh, two and a half days because given that we can't put them in here, keep asking the questions and ask more gender questions to Yusuf, please, whenever you're on a break. You're gonna allow us? Yes? One question? Oh. He's giving me all the time. I'm gonna take the whole <laughs> afternoon. Okay, we're gonna be really, um, how about three questions? short questions and remember it's about how do we scale the positive all the negative we know how do we scale the positive so any questions related to that please okay i see one question here can you stand up yes um my name is kathy bishop i teach here at carnegie mellon university and um, i just attended a session on essa which is doing some uh, studies on faculty in the region and I forgot her name, but she asked a question about gender. And one of the answers that we got was that capturing information about faculty and um, gender-related uh, pay, uh, being f happy with their jobs was difficult and so not part of it. And I just heard you mention that on Wednesday there's a group that is doing that. So I guess I'd like to suggest that you two connect and figure out how maybe ESSA could do some of this also. So it's not a question, but thank you. Yeah, great, increasing and empowering the networks we have. Great, great, great contribution. Okay, there was a, a contribution here. Yes, Just the, the white. The lovely woman in the white. Yes, okay, and then we'll get to you in the green. Merci beaucoup. Oui, plaisir, merci à vous. <coughs> Pardon. Euh, je voulais juste faire une toute petite contribution en vous disant que c'est un travail en synergie que nous devons faire entre les différents pays, les différentes communautés. Nous, je suis du Sénégal, je m'appelle Madame Sarr, je suis présidente d'une association de femmes pour la promotion des sciences et de la, euh, de la technologie. Nous avons, <coughs> excusez-moi, on nous a toujours appelé garçons manqués quand on était à la fac, mais ça nous a motivés. Donc, moi, quand j'ai commencé à enseigner, j'ai continué à travailler et aujourd'hui, je suis chercheur en essayant de voir quels sont les obstacles qui empêchent les filles de performer en sciences. Autre chose que nous avons pu faire, c'est euh, <coughs> faire euh, science et sport et une campagne « J'aime les STEM ». Si les filles aiment autre chose, elles peuvent aussi aimer les STEM. Ça, c'est évident. Je suis, euh, excusez ma voix, je suis promotrice et animatrice d'une émission à la radio qui s'appelle émission Destination Science. C'est pour faire la promotion de la science. Il y a une journée du 11 février qui est consacrée aux femmes et aux filles par l'UNESCO. Nous la fêtons chaque année. Est-ce que vous et avez une question Est-ce que vous avez une je question Je n'ai pas de question, je contribue pour vous dire ce qu'on fait okay. au Sénégal. Okay. Je pense aussi que ça peut être utile. Pour les autres, c'est des échanges. Je terminerai par vous dire qu'il faut que les filles soient motivées, <coughs> qu'elles soient ambitieuses et qu'elles soient convaincues de ce qu'elles font. Merci beaucoup. Ok, merci beaucoup pour votre contribution. So this is continuing on the idea that women, uh, girls, need to be motivated, encouraged in creative ways in terms of contributing to STEM and finding creative ways in terms of uh, saying you can love STEM and other things at the same time. So there's a contribution here. My name is Sadio Siad and uh, I am one of the ambassadors for Somalia and one of the ways actually I chose um, to help out is 
to come back to Somalia, especially in Mogadishu, yes. and uh, go to graduation ceremony for secondary schools and universities. And seeing young girls um, going out there, and also young Somali um, medical scientists, opened a lot of eyes for them. And what we have done is to set up a forum for them and so that they can actually meet other Somali diaspora who are not in the country because as you know in Mogadishu, Somalia, it is not that great in security. Um, it's basically online chatting. And so my you know, suggestion is you know, to empower young women through you know, the forums and online contributions. Thank you very much. Okay, the woman in orange, and then the men just in front of her. That'll be the last question now. Okay, oh, and then you'll get the question too. Okay. Uh, I'm Jonathan Kufido from Togo. I am a former ambassador. What I wanted to say is, it's hard to hear. before uh, women go to primary school, before they go to university, before they, they go looking for job, etc. We all have mothers. And this issue, we're not going to fix it only with forums. Me, uh, I've been educated. My mother always taught me that, I mean, you need to know how to cook. If at some point your wife is sick or she doesn't want to cook for you, you cook and you invite her to eat. So it all starts from home. It starts from home. If our mothers are aware that women can make it, if they educate us from the base, women will make it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. OK, last contribution, um, women in orange. If I could add mothers, but also fathers. Yes, fathers. Yes. Excellent comments. Equal well. opportunity Equal to opportunity. train the young kids. Yeah. OK. Uh, thank you. My name is Aretha Mare. I'm a student in science and technology policy at SPRU. And I'm also part of the Women in STEM movement. Uh, my question is directly to the Honorable Minister. Um, you have mentioned that mentorship is important. What incentives can governments come up with to incentivize the women that we work with at the grassroots level uh, who come to mentor the young girls that we are working with? Because most of the times they get involved, but the programs are continuous and intensive, and they easily get burned out but there's something that they may require, especially from government, that can help them. Um, I've heard perhaps of like tax incentives in other countries. So as African governments, what can we do? Thank you so much. We, let me first react to the gentleman's uh, point about the role of mothers and uh, the role of both parents, actually. Because in a school and in education, when parents are involved, we see a lot of good outcomes in education. And so his point is very clear. It starts from home, but it starts with the parents' involvement in education of, of all boys and girls. Coming to your question in terms of incentives, it is usually very easy. It is usually very easy if there are policies and people are committed towards implementing these policies, it becomes easy. I will give you an example. We have had challenges in secondary schools whereby the rate of learning outcomes is lower for girls. What we have done is to ensure that teachers are taught, teachers implement gender responsive pedagogy, in which really you ensure that those who are behind are not behind because they are weak. They are rather behind because there is no responsiveness to support them in several ways in which they can lag behind. One way is the perception. So it, you need to start even from primary and give them an orientation towards science so that they start playing with science as they innovate, as they become creative, as they explore the world so that they learn science at a much earlier age. But as they grow up, you need to give them an opportunity through sensitization and tailored mentorships. So when you talk about incentives, it's really not necessarily 
direct resources. For example, we have put in place some help desk for higher learning uh, students who apply for their uh, higher edu graduate education scholarships. So this helps this help them to give them a good orientation towards streamlining their research so that it, make, it is made relevant to the nation. And so with this, we hope to get a high uptake of girls to graduate studies. Because in many of the partnerships we have, we have that partnership whereby we, get, we send 20 students uh, for graduate studies, PhD. We have several other scholarship programs, including the scholarship program the government of Rwanda is supporting. And so we avail this opportunity in terms of direct support and mentorship mm -hmm. and providing the right information. And so we are, we are already seeing the results. And if we move forward on several pillars, uh, that becomes possible. Thank you. Thank you. That's an excellent point because, and it's very disruptive because often education is about let's find the best and move them forward to the system and it's very hierarchical. And so Honorable Minister has told us that really what Rwanda is doing is the creativity and intelligence is in every single child. And are we creating the enabling ecosystem? And that's very powerful because there is no country in the world that I know of that is really thinking about education in that way. And as a mother, I. I, I just have immense joy because I really believe exactly what you say and it's really how do we create the enabling conditions for every child to succeed. So maybe just to wrap up, what would be a last gift for the three of you since the, the question was towards the, the Honorable Minister and then we'll be able to move on to the next panel. Thank you. So um, quickly I would say, um, you know, storytelling is a really important tool for us. Um, th there are so many hidden figures, to use a terminology, of you know, women who have contributed a lot, but their stories haven't yet been told. And so I think if we can create stories uh, and tell the stories of the science that's taking place and of the women's leadership, I think we can make a diff big difference, that's one. Um, so I think it's bringing the art and science together, mm. uh, and really it's also the translation of science to society by storytelling. Second thing I would say is that we need to eliminate stereotypes because watch any movie, watch any TV show, and time after time you see the stereotype of women doing the same mm -hmm. old job, so it's that, that bias, an unconscious bias is created thinking that women are specifically uh, only suited for certain types of roles. And so removing those stereotypes and gender stereotypes is also an important thing to do. And on a positive note, I will agree with everybody that we have actually, Tolu, I think, said, we have come a long way, so it's a good thing, but I think we still have a long way to go. Okay, excellent point. For anybody who hasn't seen Black Panther, please go see it in terms of positive feminine gender stereotype. <laughs> we are creating Wakanda here. So please, <laughs> Haida. So um, one point and, and one question to Nef or suggestion. Um, so I said pick your patch and, and really what I want to do from my position is work with colleagues and, and our membership to ensure that we get women also into positions of leadership at the global level. We need women to help make decisions about global science agendas and to have influence to act and shape the outcomes of those agendas. So that's, that's the commitment to my patch. And then the suggestion is, I really mean it, I've, I've been so inspired by some of the examples of practices of organizations, some set up by young women to you know, develop thought leadership of women in Africa. And I think it would be great if NEF could collect, if somehow create a platform to collect those good experiences and connect the people, the men and women, mm -hmm. who are committed to this um, and who are not always connected with one another. Thank you. Tolu, close us off, please. So my two points relate to a comment that you made at the start, um, Eliana, around uh, President Kagame's mentioned that we can't afford to leave our women and girls behind because we can't afford, we have such wicked problems to address that we can't afford to have 50% of society trying to address that. So 
men, women, it, just, it doesn't make sense in terms of what needs to be done. So two aspects related to that. First, in terms of children, picking up on your comment, uh, theme is around play and socializing of, of girls, right? It starts even before the schools, right? How do we, the notion of how we construct play is really vital. We somehow subconsciously can tend to push forward curiosity-driven play in boys and care-taking play in girls. I mean, it starts there. So let's really be critical about how we, and uh, conscious about how we can harness play at school for, to promote uh, gender equity in science. And the second is partnerships. So in as much as we, see we can't afford to leave half of society behind in addressing our uh, broader societal challenges, we can't afford to not have a comprehensive approach in thinking about who is addressing this. It's phenomenal the examples that the minister has given around the policies within government. But we need people, we need other players that are working in their little cubbies, as you mentioned, lots of different examples. We need people to come to the table and actually partner together. So whether it's uh, policy, whether it's private, the example I give uh, with, with this is, is comparing to sports and cultural activities where you have associations that are invested in ensuring that the, the FIFA Premier League has the best people coming through and so they look for and nurture everyone because otherwise you lose money because people stop watching. Think about who the users of, uh, of, of science and, and scientists are. It's industry, it's policies, broader society. We can't afford to just sit back, whether it's industry, whether it's policy, say, well, let's see who comes through and then we'll just work with that. We are invested and we should be more invested in looking at new kinds of partnerships that are invested in really finding and nurturing Nurturing, uh, nurturing these, these hidden talents that are, that are often stifled. And just to mention that we really, and, 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 and I really like the tone of this session because it's really around the solution space. So we'll continue the conversation at 7.30 on Wednesday. Thank you. Yes. Perhaps it is important to mention that the policies alone are not helpful. There is a need for implementation. Mm. And therefore, let me highlight some of the examples that are tangible programs that we have in terms of ensuring equal opportunities for girls and boys, particularly at the higher level of education, but also at the secondary school level of education. There is a partnership and uh, an implementation uh, effort between the University of Glasgow and the University of Rwanda to support engineering education for women through the College of Science and Technology. That helps to optimize opportunities for girls who want to study engineering. Secondly, AIMS, AIMS has a strong uh, program to support gender uh, opportunities for girls, in which there is outreach programs in teacher education. Thirdly, I will mention that uh, one of the partners, the MasterCard Foundation, uh, has one of the projects on uh, skills development in the hospitality industry and teacher education program. And all these programs will ensure that there is equal opportunities for girls and boys, only to mention a few. There are several other examples, but because of time, I will leave it there. Uh, and we really we have a lot of projects in which we ensure that there are equal opportunities, not in terms of access, but also in terms of quality of education, relevance, using ICT technology, and so forth and so on. Thank you. Thank you very much. In closing, I just want to share a quote. I'm going to paraphrase it. My 13-year-old daughter gave me while I was preparing for this panel. She said, Mommy, she said, a government that doesn't employ uh, and, and promote the women as much as men is like a person who only uses their right hand but not their left. I'd like to thank the audience. You've been amazing. Your participation in terms of what we need to scale has been phenomenal. So thank you for excellent questions and comments. And thank you for this phenomenal panel. And keep doing what you do. Keep scaling. And all of you, let's make equity a priority and advance STEM for Africa's prosperity and sustainability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to our moderator and the speakers. Thank you.
What an inspiring and liberating panel discussion. I joined the movement and I welcome all women and men to do the same in removing your shoes. That's quite liberating. So we are now going to take a short break of 15 minutes. So I would like you all to come back to this very room in 15 minutes. Then we will be continuing with our program where there will be a launch. So we'll reconvene at 15.35. Thank you.